Um, I think I think another place that you can um, another another way that you can sort of tell your tell your story is I think through failure. I don't think Borderlands was a failure, but I remember seeing this game. Um, at E3 a couple years ago, and the art style was like totally, totally different, and it looked a lot like Fallout 3, and then Fallout 3 came out, <laughs> and uh, Borderlands was not out yet, and they basically redid everything, right? And so they said, they, they stopped as a team and said, let's make something totally, totally different. And that becomes like part of the story, right? Is that Fallout 3 used to look a lot like, I'm sorry, that Borderlands used to look like Fallout 3, and now it looks like this. And frankly, like, I think this is actually, if you look at a game like this 10 years from now, I actually think that this will hold up better than a game like Fallout 3, simply because it has a more distinct art style. It has something that actually Actually sets it apart from the other types of games that were being made. Um, this happened recently with um, with Hydrophobia, which was a game that came out for Xbox Live. And they got panned. Or they, they basically sat down and they went through every single rating and they wanted to figure out what was wrong. And then they basically like, issued a press release saying, like, we, we listened and we, we feel like we failed you in a bunch of different ways. So here are the ways that we actually could sort of change the game that actually comes out. And I think that becomes, again, that becomes part of the story. Um, I think so. One of the so I think one of the big big things that game makers can do is explain process better. Um, so um, so there's like Jackson Pollock the painter, and then there's like Jackson Pollock the process, right? And so so for Pollock, like the fact so if you just looked at that painting, not explain, not really understanding like how it was actually made, you might have one reaction. But then when you understand how it is made and Pollock's process, and that he would go in and retouch things afterwards, right? That becomes that actually adds value or changes your experience that you actually have with the finished product. Um, there's another um, abstract expressionist that I saw a couple weeks ago. This guy named Ian Stevenson who also did a bunch of splatter paints, and you look at it and it's like it's a, just millions and millions of these tiny dots. He was trying to recreate this experience of the cosmos. And he did this by basically putting these two canvases like on the floor and he would just walk around them and he would do the same thing for both canvases so they're identical. And so you look at this painting, you're like, wow, this is incredible and really deep and moving and, pa and powerful. And then you read the blurb and you're like, that's amazing. I didn't realize that was, yeah, that's what an incredible process there. I think when game makers like let people kind of like under the hood and let people know like, what are the crazy traditions that you guys have? What are the different things that you can do that sets your particular creative process? It makes it different from other people's creative process. Those things really become part of the story. And I think if you focus just on the finished product as opposed to all the things that happen on the way, I think that you're really depriving yourselves and really depriving, really depriving your fans of uh, of things that they should understand. And you know, frankly, you know, you could argue. I mean, some people might argue that people were more in love with the idea that Pollock was doing this in this way, rather than they were more in love with that idea than they were with the actual output of his art. And I, you know, frankly, I think you could probably make the same case for for some video games. Um, and then the last thing I was going to recommend it was like a sense of uh, a sense of history. And so again, this is like a progression thing. I use Braid as an example simply because I think that um, Jonathan Blow did an excellent job of sort of walking people through what the game development process looked like for him and showing it at a lot of different stages. And I think that there's a tendency a lot of times. I mean, I understand this. I mean, people come out of software and they don't want to share things. And um, but I think the more that you can give me a historical chronology of what's happened with your game and show it move from point A to point B, I think that that has a lot of value. Um, and one last thing, I mean, this is this is me. Obviously, I work partly in a physical medium, and Kill Screen does a lot of stuff digitally as well. But um, I think that thinking about packaging and design, I think, is really really important for video game makers as well. And again, we're moving into a world where everything's just going to be downloaded. But again, I think thinking more critically about like, well, what is the experience when someone picks up you know picks up an object or something like that? I think it was the guy, the Super Meat Boy guys, that did like an LP, for example, and they sold their game. And, and I mean, I think things like that end up adding a lot, even if you make it like limited or something like that of only like 100 objects. I think those things end up being really meaningful. So um, so for everybody else, so um, so for everyone else, for all people who don't make games, so what, what, what does story have to do with us? Like for someone like me, for example. Um, so you have Harvey Malich on the one side who's arguing that the value that designers um, designers have create value with their objects partly through stories by it, you can explain the design process if you can figure out all the different things that make up a design object those things have value. There's another side to it, to it though, which is um, it comes from a guy named Rob Walker who writes the consumed column for uh, for the New York Times and he uh, he wrote this book uh, about two years ago called Buying In and the argument that he makes of buying in is sort of the the converse to Harvey Malich's. So Harvey Malich is very much like a top-down. Designers control the process and then that creates meaning for the people who consume them. And Rob Walker's arguing sort of from the bottom up. He's like, no, 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 that's not actually how it works, right? Like, the fact that you have a story about, you know, the fact that you game maker doesn't have a story about, that's not actually what creates meaning. What creates meaning is this collective shared experience that people who consume objects that they, that they sort of have with each other. That's what gives something meaning. Now, I don't think that, I don't think the two ideas are mutually exclusive per se, but 
but I think that for people who play games, this ends up being very, very important. Um, he runs this blog called Significant Objects, which is really, really cool. Basically, he gets like everyday objects, like in yard sales, and then he gets writers to write stories about these objects. So he'll get like a mug or something like that, and then he gets a short story writer to write about it. And then he puts it on eBay, and the argument is that you could sell this object on eBay and it wouldn't sell for very much. But if you let someone from sort of the ground have an experience with this object, then that creates meaning for other people as well. Um, so I think like the big problem with games is that they face um, they face something I would call like the kitchen table problem. I'm sure this has probably happened to all of you at some point in time. You're like out to dinner or something like that, Thanksgiving dinner. And you sit down and everybody says like, well, what movies have you seen? What books have you read, right? And then like maybe games kind of work their way in at some point. And usually the conversation goes in one or two directions. Like everybody waits for you to finish talking about whatever meaningful game experience you've had. Or there's someone else at the table that's like, yes, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. And then you two kind of go off in the corner and you talk about <laughs> games, right? That's great. It's always great to find affinity. But I think one of the big challenges, we're moving from a world where people are not asking, like, are you a game player? They're asking, what types of games do you play, right? Which I think is a really, really important distinction. And getting people to talk, so, so for us, like for, for Kill Screen, we want to like empower people to tell good stories about their experiences playing games. Um, we want to encourage people, because I think the more that people are able to talk about what happened to them in Angry Birds or in Farmville, um, the more powerful it is for everybody. And it gets people to sort of think of themselves as people who play games as opposed to just someone who has a game or two. Um, and so, so for storytelling, I mean, there, basically I wanted to use um, um, Michael Nitsch, is a, he's a professor at, um, at Georgia Tech, and he wrote this book called Video Game Spaces. And I thought this was like a really good way to try and break down the different ways that people who play games can tell stories. Um, I sort of, <laughs> I don't know if everyone can see this. So um, just first off, a couple, a couple notes about the image. <laughs> um, one, I like that, um, first of all, that game looks awesome, by the way. Like some sort of like black and white wireframe, like abstract racing game. That looks incredible. Um, and I also like that that little boy imagines himself not as a little boy driving a car, but as a grown kind of badass dude <laughs> driving a car. Um, so so he, Michael Nitsch talks about the way that these different game spaces kind of interact and what sort of makes games different from, from other mediums. And so there are five of them. And I think that they're actually really, really good ways to think about like how we as game players can start to tell stories about our particular experiences. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, so the first, uh, the first thing is um, it's the world of co is code, which is a rule-based space is defined by, defined by code, the data, the hardware restrictions. It's a world of functional restrictions um, that often, I'm quoting him here, that often mirror architectural structuring of game, video game spaces. So I was trying to think like how do you tell good stories about what happens like with the code of games? And so I thought there's there's a pretty good there's a pretty good example. All right, uh, so I was playing Red Dead Redemption earlier today, and I noticed that there's something very odd about what I saw. I can't explain it, but it's really scary and it's chasing me. So uh, here it is. <laughs> it's a cougar man. It's a cougar. That's what it is. That's what the rag doll is. There, there he is. <laughs> Lower a little more. Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Kill it. Where is he? I don't like the fact that. Right there, right there, right there. That was a bird, dude. That was a bird. That was a bird. Where did he go? Where did he go? I know he's not done. Stop, stop hitting <laughs> me. <laughs> Kill it. Please. It's an abomination. Dude, it's creeping me out. <laughs> <laughs> Get away from my horse, man. I, I just I don't have the heart Get to it. kill it. Get it. Dude, I don't want that thing hanging in my room. Look at him, man. He's got determination. But he's running on his knees. <laughs> and he's half stuck in the ground. Zoom in a little more. I don't know how to zoom. Like this. Well, Oh, me. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, that probably deserves a clap. That deserves a clap, I think. Um, um, so, so I think for most people as game players, like we don't really interact with the world of code. But one day, one one way it does come up very often is like through glitches. And glitches are some of my favorite things in the entire world because one, um, they create experiences. They create sort of 
non-intentional experiences with the game. And I think that it, what's great about this example is that like it actually functions. It functioned for me like on two different levels. Um, one, it's really funny, obviously. But the other one is that like it actually creates a story within that game world, right? Because it's set in the Wild West, and there are all these parable. I'm sorry, all these fables about crazy things that happen in the Wild West. A man that lived as cougars or something like that, and then would hunt people and drag them back, and he walked on his hands and knees. But I think that like. Creating it, so there is a way, so I could probably show that video to like almost anybody and they would laugh whether they liked video games or not, right? Because there's something deliberately absurd about it. So I think glitches are one good, one good way to like explain game experiences to other people. It's like, well, this happened to me and it was crazy. And I have, I brought other ones, but I don't think we have time to watch them. There's one where like they, people turn into birds and Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption was like full of glitches, I guess, but like uh, this one was really good. I will fast forward. <laughs> So the next space is uh, is the mediated space, um, which is um, so. Michael Mitch talks about. He says this world is um, the base of mediated space, which consists of all the output the system can provide in order to present the rule-based game universe to the player. Um, and this mainly consists of the audiovisual and tactile output, right? And so that's basically like what we see when we play video games. And so I would like to share an experience of, of that with me. Um, so I came home and I was going to finish Flower, the game that I mentioned before. And I was a little bit drunk, I have to admit. And I was on the last level, and I remember sitting there. There's sort of like you know, because flower is all about like reclaiming nature, and I remember having this like really powerful kind of like because of the way that flower looked, and me having like a couple beers, and I just like having this really overwhelming sense that I was doing something that felt really really meaningful to me because of what I was like actually seeing on the screen, and so that I like relating that story to other people to explain like why games have meaning for me. Um, I, I one of my our, um, our business partner Chris Dolan wrote about Bioshock Two and his experience of being a father in terms of like seeing what he saw in, in Bioshock 2 in terms of sort of the strong fatherhood themes in that. Um, and I don't think it's something that's limited in terms of like what you see is something that has to be limited to like, you know, super high budget, you know, super high budget games. I think smaller games can do the same thing. There's an iPhone game called um, called Comaten where you play as like a little star and you just kind of, it has this really cool art style and it's very nice because it, it, it created this like imaginary world for me. Um, the next one is uh, like the fictional space they talks about, and this is the one I think player we sort of talk about the most. And the fictional space is um, when we're confronted with what we're actually seeing, and we imagine a world um, with the provided information that they give us. Uh, and I, I'm going to just kind of run through the rest of these because we're kind of running out of time. There's two more. So the play space, um, the play space is, is uh, based on uh, the fictional world that players decide on the actions to affect the game space, right? And so the play space I think has been something that we're talking a lot about recently because of the Wii and like the Connect. And again, this can be a really powerful locus for stories that you can share with other people in terms of getting to explain like what it is that they're feeling when they play games. So we got to connect when, when it just came out, and we had like a little kill screen retreat, and uh, we were just kind of sitting at, at, at my apartment. And one of our editors, Ryan, we just got to connect, and he really wanted to play Connectimals, which is like this game with these little baby animals. It's basically like you know, it's yeah, it's just it's these little adorable animals, and you reach out and pet them. And so like this grown man standing in front of the screen, like with his hands kind of like outstretched, like trying to sort of pet this animal that doesn't actually exist, right? And us watching him. Again, this is like a story that I can share with other people, explain like what it is that I love about games. Um, you know, when people break their TVs with the Wiimote, right? That's another place for stories to happen. Nintendo Thumb when Nintendo first came out. Um, Dance Dance Revolution. These are all things, like that kid who falls off the Dance Dance Revolution machine on YouTube. Like, these are all things that like sort of create, uh, create possibilities for stories. And the last one is, um, is the social space. Um, so its actions in the virtual world can affect the spaces of other players on the layer of a uh, of, of social space. I had, um, I just have one example of that. I gave a talk at um, I, I gave a talk at something, it's called the Elmhurst School, or excuse me, the Pinehurst School in New Haven, Connecticut. And it's a school that's run by Yale, and it's for um, children with like severe emotional and psychological um, disabilities. And the school is designed to sort of take kids, they take kids like out of high schools, and then it's to reacclimate them back in the high school. And I went there to just talk about what I did, and 
there were a lot of kids there because they just wanted to like talk about video games. And the most fascinating thing was like getting getting them to think about what they did in their game spaces as something that is connected to who they are as individuals. And so two of the kids got in a really really big argument about um, about sniping and about whether or not it was like okay to be a camper or not. And so, but I was really challenging them. I was like, so why do you feel this way? Why do you think that this is an illegitimate way? Like, it you know basically you know because one side is arguing that there are and, and crazy because they're not necessarily thinking this world. I was like, yes, there are rules and conventions for warfare, right? They're like the British during the Revolutionary War. And they say, you know, you like go out in the middle of the field with a gun and you shoot each other and that's how you fight. And the other guy's like, no, 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 I'm going to hide in the trees. I'm just going to pick you off again and again and again, right? So like getting, getting people to think about, getting people to think about like what they do as in play spaces is something that really affects who they are and how they affect the interact with the world is really, really important. So I, you know, I think like in closing, there's a quote from Gandhi. He says like, be the change that you want to see in the world, right? And so I feel like if we want people to take video games seriously, I think as game makers, you need to explain this why. It's so important, so, so important, because that can really draw in people who really don't care about games if you convince them that there is actually a really powerful story. If you create a folklore mythology around your games before they're even released and explain that process, that's a great way to get people involved. For everybody else, and this includes game makers as well, like if we don't overcome this dinner table problem, if we're too embarrassed to talk about what happens to us in game worlds, if we're too embarrassed to you know, sort of share what happens to us in game space, Spaces with other people, then yes, we will be sort of outcasts in culture. But that will be a bed that we make in. That, uh, that will be a bed that we make in, so we'll have to sleep in it. Thank you very much. Are there any, uh, any, any questions? Does anybody have any questions, comments, critiques? Shoot. Uh, good question about telling stories about games. As as you say, the culture is broader and more people are actually playing them. You can talk about them. But like you say, the question now is, what types of games do you play? Mm -hmm. um, don't we still face the challenge of it's really hard to tell a good story about a game that someone has no context of, and a problem that we actually face among the community of people who may actually play a lot of games? But yeah. I mean, it's much safer to write about Super Meat Boy than it is to write about you know Comet or you know some yeah. game that you were the only person who voted for in the 2010 list. Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think that um, so I, I think part of it. I mean, part of this has to do with like one-on-one -on -one interaction, like understanding where, where somebody's coming from. So, like for friends I know who are in the film, like it's easier for me to explain a game like Limbo as like, oh, this is what would happen if Tim Burton uh, made a video game, right, with uh, with Orson Welles, right? And they're like, oh, okay, I understand it from a visual style. But maybe somebody who plays sports, for example, you might be like, well, this is exactly, you know, Modern Warfare probably has a lot in common with playing, you know, with playing football. And like that's one of the things that we've been trying to like work on with like with our reviews, for example, is like let's try and think of a, we should be able to isolate a single part of the game and be able to use it as a way to explain what's happening in that entire system, if possible. And like using reviews and writing about games as a, well, I think one of the big problems with writing about games is that it's it's really uh, a means to an end. Like you're basically trying to explain these things to make people, help people make purchasing decisions about whether or not they should buy something, as opposed to look, at, and this is what frustrates me about video game writing, unlike other forms of writing, other forms of critique, is that if you look at music criti criticism, if you look at you know other forms of criticism, those are ends in and of themselves. And people write those things because they recognize that there's value in just explaining what is happening in this particular medium and finding ways to connect that to other people's experiences. So I mean, the great thing about writing about games is that they actually, you know, when you go to see a movie, that experience of going to see movies, like it's a very static one in the sense that you go and sit in a theater and then something is projected to you. But with games, like there's so much more that happens there, and so it's a challenge, but it's also like a real opportunity because I feel like there's so much that you can describe. Um, you know, I've never laughed so hard when I played Left 4 Dead or something like that. It's a really funny game or something like that. So, I mean, I think we can look at what uh, how people have written about other mediums. I think music's a really good one in part because music is very oblique; it's not very direct, and I. I was a music critic, and it's very frustrating to write about music, just because explaining what is happening, especially if you're to non-musicians. I'm not a musician myself, and so that, that was a challenge in of itself, but then also explaining things to other non-musicians about why you should like this. Um, I mean, that's been helped, obviously, by the internet. People can just kind of listen and decide if they like it or not. So, But yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. I like to talk about video games related to the film industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, it seems like in film, when journals like uh, Cahiers de Cinema mm -hmm. were published, that that's when film began to become legitimate, when people saw that there were larger intellectual conversations that you know, non-film fans, or just intellectuals in general, could jump in on. Did you choose to launch Kill Screen now because you think we're approaching that point with video games? Uh, yeah, I do, actually. Um, I, I think the timing, uh, you know, obviously, 
the timing is really, really ripe. I think in part because there are more people playing video games. That We're the first generation that has grown up with video games as something that was in the home as opposed to the previous, like for, for boomers, for example, they made an active decision about whether or not they were going to participate in video game culture or not. And for someone like me, like all my friends, just that was something that was purchased by parents and it was something that was kind of that was a decision that they made for me. And so now that I'm getting older and moving into seats of power, I think there's like, you know, a much larger audience of those types of people. Um, yeah, I think Kahir Dusimana is a great, great, great example. I, I, mean, I do think the other thing, it's not so much whether or not film became relevant at that time period, because there's definitely lots of early film that is very, very good, right? And so, but it, there is sort of this process that does take time, and I think we're kind of moving into this place. I mean, the best signs of this is like the New York Times has a video game critic, and the New Yorker writes about video games like at all. I mean, you know, it's never going to be a place, you know, it's never really going to, they're never really going to be places that really write about video games the way that maybe people who love video games really want to hear about them. But the fact that those things are actually happening is really, really powerful. So, I mean, a movie like Inception, right? If there's ever, I feel like there's ever a sign that, like, that is a movie that is about video games, right? Like, Ellen Page's character is a video game designer, and Christopher Nolan is someone who understands how video games work. And the fact that people can walk into that theater and think about, like, well, it's really cool. Isn't that amazing that she can make these infinite stairwells and play with physics. It's like, that's what video game designers do. They sit down and they create these dream worlds. And like the fact that a game like that has resonance, I think is really, really powerful and that's a really popular film. So I think that, you know, I feel very fortunate in that I feel like we're moving into an era where people do want to have these more serious conversations about video games. That's very, very exciting for me. Do you, do you worry as a, as a writer and as, as now a publisher too that, that we run the risk of being reductive with with the category of games and even just video games, right? Sure. In that, um, you know, I, I saying I like music. Well, what kind of music do you like? Or I like movies. Well, what kind of movies do you like? Yeah. Or, or, or I like, you know, what the written language. You know, like I mean, it's like it's one of these things where where I, I wouldn't necessarily trust a a, a, a critic of, of classical music to, to recommend a hip hop album to me, right? right and so right. like, so we've got this idea that like so and so could just play a game. And, 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 that, and, and that maybe maybe the people who are making games right now, and it's growing, but that, that we like games too much, and we like the kind of games that we make too much, so we sure. make the same type of games over and over and over again, and that if we can get more people who like more different things liking more games, then we'll get more different games, and, and we need to be less reductive, and you can call it games and like, be like... Yeah. Here's yeah, a sports no, magazine. Or here's a no, I agree with you. I mean, I think the challenge is like we're still we're just getting to the place where people can just say I like ga like I like games at all, yeah. right? So before we can be more specific, it's like well, I like RPGs, and I mean that's always that's always a funny conversation to have with people. This is a conversation I have with people like I don't really like games. I'm like that's not true because you're a person. So there is some game out there. <laughs> There's some game out there. Everybody has a particular game that they like, and so but I, I I think you're totally right, and that's like a nuanced conversation that comes after you're already. A permanent piece of like the cultural pantheon, and then you can be like, no, I am just a German techno minimalist, and that's what I'm into. Um, that will happen with games, also. I, I think it's really interesting because like, I think Farmville is like the first thing approaching like, I would say like a popular. It's the first time I've seen other people who play games kind of like sort of look their nose down. It's like sort of like a James Patterson right. of the video game world. You know, it's the first kind of thing that like. I, I think one of the nice things about games is that people, I think part of, and this is something like it's weird because it is a problem, but it's also very nice because I find that because we take a reductive approach often when we're talking about games, that like people don't make highbrow, lowbrow distinctions. And you know what I mean? There are people who play Limbo and they also play Gears of War and they do those things. But that will probably change over time, and there will be like, a, I mean, you know, I think that that as that can be a problem with like the indie game scene, for example. And I meet a lot of people who are like, I only play indie games, and I'm like, why? Like, why? 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 What is the value in that? Explain that to me. Like, there, there are different play experiences. There are things that you could learn from Cliff Bozinski in terms of like what he does as a game designer. And so that is. So I agree with you. Like that is a real problem, and I think that. It would be a good problem to have. Like when people are like actually being snooty about these sorts of things, or people really dialing deep. It's like, yeah, I only play Japanese RPGs. It's the only thing that I play. Um, I th yeah, but you're totally right. You're totally right. So I'm I'm not a lot worried about in the sense that like when that becomes a real problem, we'll have already that will be a good problem, really good problem to have. Um, I have a question about distribution. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who's living in Japan who's a good game developer, and he would love to read Killstream. But yes. he has to import, which is very 
prohibitively expensive. Yes. And he has an iPad, and he would love to pay the subscription fee to read your magazine on iPad. We are working on it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I had to ask for him. No, no, no. no. Um, so um, a couple things, like so. One, it's like one of the big challenges with doing any kind of physical product. It's just hard to get it to people in other countries, and like retail is like a total pain in the ass. And so, um, it, it, it retail is built on a volume model. Basically, like if you ha if you print like three million copies, because that's the thing. If you look at magazines, like their sell through rate is like, oh, we had a ten percent sell through rate on a million copies of a magazine a month, right? It's built on knowing that like we're just sending millions and millions of copies out to people, and that's how they get them to J Japan and places like that cheaply. Um, we at some point will release a mobile, some type of mobile iteration. I don't know what form that's going to take, but one thing to look for is on our website, we're going to start handpicking certain stories that we like. We've been redesigning them. This guy over here, Jeremy Borthwick, is one of our designers. Uh, we've been redesigning some of the stories because we recognize that there are people in other countries who do want to read the content, and that's really important to us. It's just we wanted to figure out year one, like, let's figure out how to do a magazine first, and then. But yeah, tell your friend like, yeah, tell them to just um, keep reading the website because there's a lot, there's like lots of really good. Great stuff that's going up there too. Please do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Shoot. Uh, so when you brought up the Kyrie Cinema, it made me think of something about that publication that was really important, and that it wasn't just that it was a serious discussion about film, but it was also where the French New Wave filmmakers were talking to each other. I mean, they were a lot of issues of that journal were just Trufo, mm -hmm. Qatar going, "You're a jerk." No, you're <laughs> a jerk, right? Like, uh, and I have to wonder. And I come from more, uh, I come from more communications background, not a design background. Like, I went to my first post Boston postmortem last month, and it was scary. Uh, <laughs> but I'm wondering if is there a Coyote Cinema now, or room for it, or space for it? I mean, does Gama Sutra kind of work that way? Where you have creators of games discussing the game creation art, in quotes, with each other in the same way that the New Wave were discussing film with each other. Sure. I mean, because the New Wave was all about experimentation, and I guess that's kind of where the indie scene is going compared to the commercial scene, unquote. I'm doing a lot of this. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I think it's, um, I mean, one, I would say the internet's been a, I mean, blogs have been, that's been one of the greatest things about, like, you know, Clint Hawking's blog. You can go and see, like, what Clint Hawking actually thinks. And obviously, given the way that the video game industry, I mean, <sighs> One of the problems, right, with that is that like a lot of video game designers, because of whatever contractual arrangements, don't feel liberated to actually talk about what's going on in their head, and that's a very different situation than what I mean. Film, again, so film had the benefit at that time period. Oh, I mean, I, I don't know the history of French cinema, but like at the time, at least for American, I mean, that was very new for film directors to be like individuals, like individual personalities, because that was something they weren't allowed to do during the early days. And right now, the, I think one of the big problems is that I think that there are a lot of ideas that would like to be shared, but because the video game industry looks like the studio system of Hollywood from, you know, sort of the pre-Paramount case, there's all this talent and ideas, but like people don't, you know, designers don't feel like they can just like start a blog and just like talk about what's going on in their lives. And there are a couple people who can do that, right, or they're at a point in their career where they feel comfortable doing that. But um, one, I do think that there is space for something like that. But I think that there are structural problems with the way that the video game industry is designed that keeps a lot of really good, talented people from saying what they actually feel because they're scared of their marketing departments or whatever. I mean, there are actual repercussions for them actually talking about what's going on. Not to mention, video game journalists don't, in general, do a very good job of um, they don't do a job, good job with like subtlety or nuance, right? And it's like one of the problems with having it's one of the problems with having an entire, because video game journalism grew up in the age of the internet, right? I think that there are certain commercial forces that force blogs to drive traffic to their sites, and I think it engenders um, some not so positive journalistic tendencies. And I imagine, I'm not a video game designer, but I, I know that there are many who have been burned because they were honest, or they said something in context, and they're trying to be honest, and they get burned, and then they feel like they can never say anything ever again because they're getting a call from you know the PR departments, like, well, what'd you say, what'd you say? Well, it doesn't matter what you said. This is what everybody thinks that you said. So, I mean, again, they have the benefit of, like, the, I mean, the difference there is that, like, Godard and Truffaut have complete control over what is being disseminated to public, and video game designers don't. So it, I agree. I think there probably is space for something like that. Um, 
I don't think that's what we're going to necessarily do, simply because I think we're very focused on um, sort of letting, sort of being a mouthpiece to tell good stories, not just about people who make games, but also for people who play them. But I totally agree. I think that that's something that somebody out there wants to start. But again, I think that there are some other like bigger forces that probably need to change first um, before you really get kind of design, you know, designers on the level of like Truffaut, or not in terms of talent, but in terms of like freedom to actually say what they say what they feel. Um, so a couple years ago, I was hearing a bit more, a little bit about uh, like new game journalism and the concept of the subjective experience is sort of and, and that kind of storytelling. Does does Kill Screen put itself in any context of that? Is that on the? Um, so I would say we would put ourselves in the context more of like than like just new journalism, right? So. We've also so this is this is a problem that we so it's not a problem per se but when people pitch us for example we get a lot of people who love the mechanics of games but they don't love the mechanics of writing and my background and and I think that I would prefer I would rather have because let me back up one of the problems with mainstream publications writing about video games, right, is that they love the mechanics of writing, but they don't love the mechanics of games, right? And so they understand how to put together a story. So New Yorker has a template and great editors, and they understand these things in the abstract, but nobody there really knows about video games, right? We're kind of the other way around, where like Chris and I and our editors, we all know about video games, but we also love writing. And so like when people write for us, the things that we send them often are not, is not other games writing. It's like we send them other good writing periods. Like read this Pauline Kael review of Bonnie and Clyde from like 1967. Like read that and then think about like how, what are the mechanics that are work there as a writer for her that are applicable to what you do as a game writer. And that's really, really hard. And so I'm not saying that there aren't any antecedents to like what we're trying to do, but when I think about like who is Kill Screen competing with or who, who are the other things, I think about like what are the things that I read in my life and what are the things that are really powerful for me? And they're not always things that are written about games. And there are exceptions. Like Tom Vissel's book is excellent, I think in part because he's he is a writer first and a game player second. And we need more writer first, game player second, as opposed to the other way around. And so that's that's what we're trying to sort of cultivate. And it takes time. But um, I mean some of it's also just like Getting people who love games, um, getting people who love games to also understand that there is a different way that they can write about them, and um, so we want, definitely want to create a culture of writers who aren't necessarily looking, aren't necessarily. I mean, there's nothing wrong. I mean, there's lots of great people who write about games, and many of them write for Kill Screen. But um, I really encourage, you know, I really encourage in terms of thinking about games writing. Like, let's just think about like arts and culture writing first, and let's figure out what they do well before we figure out exactly. Let's do that first, and then we can try and figure out a little bit better what games good games writing looks like. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good